All right. Good afternoon. How are you guys? Good. Doing okay? Everybody all right from the hurricane, I hope? Or at least okay? Anybody have crazy stories? Too soon? <laughs> how, can you guys hear me okay in the back next to that? Okay. I'm going to try to project as much as I can. Um, I do have audio recording. Hopefully this is going to be acceptable audio quality. I won't really know until we get back and I upload the video and everything. So if anybody's watching online, I am live now. So say hello to the internet. All zero people that are watching yet. Um, but if you ever if you ever are interested, for whatever reason, you could pull up this live right now if you felt like it, to mute it. Or you could, you know, if you have to stay home sick or whatever, should every lecture be live streaming here, you'll kind of see my face. I mean, you can see where the webcam will be. Um, what I see over here is um, my slides here, what I was projected on that screen, and myself in the little corner. And if you were to talk to me, I'll see it here, and I can chat back to you or answer it live. So that's the system I'm using in place of Zoom, which nobody really likes too much. Um, and so if you, if you need any information on where to find that live stream, uh, it's on the syllabus. It's twitch.tv, which is you know, gamer live stream platforms. Kind of funny. Um, and dot, so so twitch.tv slash snows lab um, is, is the link. So how many of you had a chance to take a look at the readings and uh, the recorded lecture, or at least one of those? OK. Um, how many of you? perhaps missed all that and maybe signed up late or something, missed the emails, anybody completely out of the loop? Okay. I know, and I do apologize that first week. I know at least one of you um, uh, missed the boat on registering for the classes and therefore my Moodle emails didn't reach you, so you probably showed up here. I think the rest of us are happy that it turned out that I was traveling for a conference and we couldn't have class here in the, the oven, <laughs> or so I heard. I was on an email chain where it was like all sorts of faculty like complaining, whining about the conditions in here. And I was like, well, glad I'm not there. <laughs> and I'm sure you guys, if you had to endure that, are happy this was one fewer class. Um, another reason to, to do live, live lectures from home if I'm sick or if this lecture hall is uh, incapacitated again, well, we'll just do that. Um, for the most part, I plan to be here in person. I'll be using my handy little touchpad and fancy little glove so that I can write on the slides, make notes. I'm going to post these slides. In the future, I will try to have the slides posted before class in case you wanted to take notes on those slides yourself. But I'll definitely post the slides after I've scribbled on them. So you'll have that. I'll post a YouTube link for this uh, lecture video if you need to go back through it. Um, so that's, that's kind of the plan for the lecture you saw. Um, from home, I recorded that one. So it should be kind of similar. Um, OK. I, I'm also going to have to apologize. I had quite a bit of technical difficulties today. For my first class, my audio driver decided not to recognize the laptop's webcam. So I spent some time trying to fix that and decided to just bring another webcam to capture the audio. I think it should be fine. But that said, I had a little less time to prep the lecture than I intended. So. I think we'll be OK, and I have kind of an activity to, to walk you through. Um, but I will personally, I, I like to be more organized than I probably am today. So hopefully that will be apparent in the future. Anyhow, um, I have a few questions to ask you guys in the form of a Kahoot activity thing. So we'll get on to that. Then we'll come to the mass balances, kind of principles of those. I think during the recorded lecture, I, I brought us to a word problem that we we're going to take a look at. It's a very simplified mass balance, good starting point to kind of take a look at what we're doing. And so we'll pick up there um, in a few minutes and kind of check to see how well you can uh, perform that. And again, everything's preliminary right now. I'm just kind of seeing where you're at, how you're feeling about the topics that we'll be covering um, so far. And I'll. I'll say a little bit more about myself as I go through that Kahoot um, with you as well. OK, so a few things regarding kind of environmental engineering 
in general. And this class is funny because it doesn't really have a name, right? It's just EVEG 2000. I feel like, or, or even, you know, environmental engineering one, what, what does that mean? <laughs> so I would rather have a little bit, you know, some sort of meaningful title. And I guess what it really, this class is really about is paving the fundamental concepts for you to perform any sort of environmental calculation that you might be interested in. So we're going to go through the, the very uh, fundamentals, stuff you already know, except we're going to go beyond that and start learning some of the jargon and how to apply these, you know, things maybe you already have some intuition about, you know, conservation of mass is not such a fancy concept, you kind of know that, but how can we actually use that assumption and apply it to an environmental system to learn something about how far the oil spill is going to go, for example. So that's kind of the, uh, the premise of the class. Here, the, the three unifying theories that really, almost the whole um, field really is, is based on is conservation of mass, conservation of energy, and then of course Einstein's like, well, they're also related, right? Conservation of mass and energy. So that would be that E equals MC squared, right? So there, there's some relationship there, at least for cases where you've got enough energy for that to matter. So really, if we want to know something about how much energy is released by this, this fire, or how, how far that smoke is going to travel, what impact that's going to have on the water, we really have to come down to certain fundamentals uh, to be able to understand that. So. Um, what can we do with that? I mentioned this is really the, the foundation for almost everything. And if we take a, take a thought about the oil spill, I will, I will have a more formal um, quiz or activity for you regarding those readings. So that's not today. Um, but I wanted to give you those because it, it really hopefully kind of sparks your, your interest or attention to the different processes involved. Right? Some of the oil is going to be eaten by microbes, but how do we know how much? Some of it may be photodegraded, so the sunlight is going to blast the oil compounds on the surface of the water, but how, how can we quantify what role? Like, is that 10%? Is that 50%? Is that 0.1%? How do we know these things, and how much of an impact does that have? If you specifically compare the deep water horizon in the Gulf, very sunny, happened in April, and then you had the full summer ahead of you. Compare that to the Exxon Valdez in Alaska. I don't remember what month that was. Um, I don't think it was midsummer, but regardless, Alaska's solar profile is a lot different than Louisiana's or the Gulf, right? So you can expect at minimum sunlight difference is going to be there. Then you, if you're digging into the reading, you'll realize that the oil itself has a different composition. The, the temperature is hugely different. And if you remember from Gen Chem, there's always that annoying temperature value in your enthalpy you know, and, and all those equations. The reaction rates are dependent, for the most part, on, chemi on the temperature. So chemical reactions are going to happen slower when up in the refrigerated Alaska, or frozen Alaska. You, know, you keep things in the refrigerator for a reason. That's going to slow down the biology, too. Down here in the Gulf, we've got biological activity going uh, going really wild on. So that, at the end of the day, there's all sorts of parameters here, even wind or currents, that change what's going to happen to the oil, how much of an impact it has, where it has the impact, how long it lasts. You know, in Alaska, there's still oil buried under, um, in, in some beaches that maybe the best thing to do is just leave it buried and not disturb it, because it's, yeah, it's impacted that, that soil and the beach there, but it's kind of sequestered by now, and if, you know, if it's just going to sit there, slowly be eaten by bacteria, well, maybe that might be the best option. Whereas here, most of the impacts have already been resolved, and that's, you know, 20, 30 year difference. So, uh, a couple things about the, the physical, the, kind of the basic principles here. We'll just briefly talk about those, and then I'll go over to our activity. So in terms of these fundamental processes, what can happen to um, matter or energy? And really, most of what I will talk about, or what we'll work with in this class, is going to be matter. Uh, it turns out that 
you know, if you if you divide environmental engineering into a few subdisciplines, you've got um, air quality, which is very much physical, very much chemical, not so much biological, although there are some applications for um, air treatment using uh, biological reactors. You kind of flow the air by them and transport some of the contaminants into the biofilms and stuff. So you'll have air pollution control. That's one genre. You'll have kind of water quality, uh, and you can split that into wastewater treatment and regulation or drinking water treatment. I've done a little bit of both myself. I'll get into that a little more, but that's kind of my background is water treatment. And then you've got sort of remediation. So looking at some sort of spill in the environment, um, chemical cleanup operations, things like that, where maybe you're dealing with the soil, groundwater, um, that's kind of its own genre as well. And then you have the energy sector. So uh, that usually gets lumped into renewable um, and sustainability endeavors. It's a little bit different of a topic because a lot of times you're, you're mixing that with maybe economic analysis or you ought to, and you're looking at how long some laptop is gonna last. You know, wondering today if my, my audio card just broke or if it's just a driver issue that I'm, I'm struggling with. And so I'm thinking to myself, well, this laptop's not very old. What am I gonna have to do? Can I open it up and replace that audio card? Is it, is it integrated fully? Like, what's, what's the deal here? I don't even, you know, I'm starting to, to think about what this is gonna take for me to use this properly. If I have to throw it away and get a new one, not gonna do that, but if I, had, if I felt like I had to, then, you know, that, that, all that equipment, all that energy and cost and um, heavy metals that went into making this, are now needing to be recycled, processed, whatever, and demand for a new one is here. So that kind of all gets captured in the energy sustainability um, sort of discipline, I would say, um, life, life cycle analysis. Okay, so anyway, physical. In terms of how we map things that um, are happening in the environment, physical is an obvious and important one where we have um, advection, that would be a current, so maybe like a air or water current, that's literally pushing stuff somewhere, right? An air gust will push whatever smoke is in that bit of air, it'll push it along, and it's called advection, okay? Dispersion is a little bit um, different, and so over here you see this plume, and it's kind of a, a rising smokestack you see. Uh, perhaps it would, and this I guess is an oil oil plume, if there was no current it would probably travel up right here, so you kind of see that, but there's a current heading east apparently, and that's pushing pushing it that way. So uh, dispersion is sometimes a little bit confusing because it's not quite molecular diffusion where molecules are randomly moving, but it's also not advection, it's somewhere in between where you have like an, an eddy and it's kind of pushing particles around more randomly, not like one bulk direction. Um, you could also think of dispersing the oil spill um, compounds, right? You're adding something to allow particles or allow these oil molecules to disperse, to travel more freely. Um, I guess a, the best way to describe this would be Kind of like micro advection. Especially with some sort of like mixing. Or at edges of gradients. So if you have um, So if you have some water flowing, and then you have an eddy, which is like kind of like a swirly little thing, and some of your stuff then gets moved, instead of just flowing along like normal, it kind of gets swirled and moved up some random other direction. That would be an example of dispersion. So we're not gonna deal too much with it. I just wanted to label these so that you kind of know what we're talking about um, when they come up. Diffusion is simply a a physical process that is driven by what we call a gradient. So if you have high concentration of something over here, the random motion is 
going to naturally create a force to push that somewhere else. So if you, in water treatment, we have an example of osmotic pressure. Um, and if you've ever seen the uh, 90s movie, Osmosis Jones, you might really still not have an idea, but it's a funny movie anyway. Um, osmosis is essentially just that. You have some salt, and over here, if it's concentrated, and over here it's not concentrated, it's gonna have a pressure pushing that way. If you get some sort of a membrane, like a cell membrane or a filter, filtration membrane, membrane filter, then it might stop the salt, and you have to, you can either push water through, or that will pull water across. And so you, you can manipulate this with reverse osmosis, that's how you um, desalinate, it's one way. If you had um, a lot of salt over here, and you wanted clean water, and you had a membrane, you push really hard, and then the water will go through, and the salt will not. But it requires a lot of pressure because the salt wants to go through, or the water wants to come backwards in some sense. So that's, I mean, that's more, more than just diffusion there. So I'll, I'll take a step back and say diffusion then is just the random motion, and that's also why gradients can exist, and it tries to even the concentration out. This can happen in air as well, just you'll see a smokestack. If it's a very still day, it'll just be going straight up, no advection, and then it'll slowly be clouding outwards. That's diffusion doing that molecular random block stuff. So if we get really deep into how to describe one of these, which we're not really going to do in this class, but you could for maybe groundwater cleanup, air quality, whatever, you need a term for, okay, this advection is going to move this amount of the stuff. And then on top of that, you're going to have maybe some diffusion. If you have a, a simple enough case, maybe you can ignore dispersion, right? Or if you want to get really complicated, maybe you add it. Chemistry or chemical processes would be a second topic. Here, mostly we're going to deal with reactions, whether they're irreversible, like something combusting, or uh, reversible, like changing pH back and forth, equilibrium reactions, solubility reactions. Um, maybe you can dissolve a salt, but if you, you can potentially reverse that if you're removing a lot of the water and it gets really concentrated, then you'll have precipitation, right? That's a reversible reaction there. So some of both there. Predominantly, we're going to use those for oxidation, sometimes reduction processes. We'll cover that a little more later. It's also one of the primary modes of disinfection. Chlorination is definitely a chemical. Ozonation can have advanced oxidation processes, fancy chemicals, sometimes with ultraviolet light, blasting them into pieces, making radicals that just react with them almost anything. So those are the, the things, and we're, we'll talk about uh, each one of those um, on, their, on their own, pretty much. Then there's biological. Um, we're not going to go too far into biological processes in the class, um, except that we want to understand, OK, if you have a mass of bacteria and they're growing, how is that going to change over time when they have a lot of food? Or how is that different if they don't have a lot of food? You know, there's Certain things we want to know about um, how much food they're eating. Maybe they're, they're consuming our hazardous waste for us and doing us a big favor. Well, how long is it going to take for them to eat it? How much bacteria do we need? Do they lack some sort of nutrient? If we add them, if we add that, how quickly can they then perform the work that we want them to do? We also need to know something about biological processes, at least how to quantify them for disinfection. Uh, in my research group, we do a lot of disinfection, so we often work with viruses. Um, these are bacteroviruses, so safe for us to deal with, unless you know, maybe if we accidentally consume some, they might infect the bacteria in our gut, but that's not likely, and that's, you know, they're very specific with their targets, and it probably wouldn't, we probably wouldn't notice anyway. So bacteriophages are a very easy example used pretty commonly in disinfection, because we can test them very easily and ethically against bacteria. Um, and then we can visibly count the spots where bacteria are missing. So we have different biological methods and tools that we can use to understand the biological side of the environment. Of course, there's lots more that you can do, uh, but wastewater treatment is a big one. Ground 
groundwater remediation, um, a lot of different remediation projects do involve biological processes. So there's certainly a, an element there. Finally, energy. So here we would be talking about um, energy balance, which uh, energy transfer, really thermodynamics. And you'll, you'll have a thermodynamics class eventually. I think right now our current thermodynamics is in the mechanical engineering department. So that'll probably give you a good energy background um, in terms of how does a Carnot cycle work? How, you know, how can we predict what, you know, what's going to happen with the energy? How much work do we get out with this type of engine? Something like that. There's also very related topics for, let's say, cloud formation or what's going to happen if a parcel of air, is how you call it, is heated or is raised or lowered in the atmosphere. So those, those types of things are also thermodynamically driven with energy balances and the like. Of course, energy, you would also consider carbon balance. You know, how much carbon is emitted by the, uh, this river that's on fire here in Russia from an oil pipeline break uh, compared to a nuclear power plant, right? So there's all sorts of different considerations there. Okay, uh, I would like to show you a little quiz now. So for our participation, um, participation in this class, generically, what I'm going to do is have you participate in these cahoots. And essentially what, what's gonna happen is you go on your phone or computer Go to kahoot.it, in case you've never done this before. Punch in that number, and then with your, when it asks you for a nickname, use your 8-9 number. And there's two reasons for that. One, it makes it very easy for me to download the Excel sheet and track who's here, what scores you got, all that. So use your 8-9 number and get it right, please, <laughs> for, for both of our sakes. Um, the other thing is, it'll make you anonymous. Um, if you don't mind, please don't use the dash. It's not gonna be a problem this time. Don't worry about it. But in the future, just don't, just the numbers would be perfect. Um, yeah, then it, then it makes you anonymous, so nobody's you know laughing at somebody who got them all right or whatever. So part of this is just gonna be getting to know you a little bit. Part of it will be kind of seeing where your knowledge is at, what you've maybe encountered so far. Just a few little questions. Kahoot is, has this premium membership that lets you do polls instead of quizzes. So today it's gonna to look like a quiz. There's gonna be a right answer for what's your favorite color kind of thing. And of course there's no right answer for that. That's just because that's the way to do it free. So just ignore that. Um, okay, so with that, some of the first questions are about you, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I can't remember if I said so, said all this in, um, in the recorded lecture, but I, I wanna say that, I was gonna save it for in person so I could actually like, see you guys. But, so, well you know, I'm Sam Snow. Um, I've been at LSU since 2016, so about five years now. Um, this is my first time teaching to EBITS 2000, so have some, like I said, little less organized and the start of the semester has been weird with my travel and then Ida coming through. But I feel I feel like it's gonna be a good semester. I'm happy to be teaching the class because I haven't taught it before and I'd like the chance to get to know you guys in the environmental program because in the past I've only been teaching 3110 which is water and wastewater treatment and I've only been teaching it for the civil engineers. So I have to dumb down the chemistry for them and uh, kind of slow, slow it up a bit. Some of the things that you guys should learn in this class um, and in water chemistry and just hopefully you're more inclined towards chemistry than the, the civil students, I would think. Um, so anyway, I, it's nice. I'm, I'm excited to get to know you guys a little bit. With this size of a class and with the masks, I think I'll have a little bit of a hard time getting all of your names, so be patient with me. It'll take me a little while, especially if people end up attending online or something often. But happy to get to know you, happy to say hi. And um, in terms of my, my personal uh, feeling about our uh, mask situation and everything, 
Um, I'm, I'm complying, although I don't think it's actually particularly important since I'm vaccinated and I won't come to campus if I'm feeling sick. So I'm going to say hello and let you actually see my, my face. Um, so I'm not particularly uh, feeling like this is super important, but for the sake of the university and all that, go on with it. Um, I hope that the uh, air is not too much of a, an issue. I was going to move, but I mean, where is this I need pretty much to go. Okay, awesome. So I'm, I'm going to continue trying to project. There will be days, this is my second class, and so some days I might just come in and be like, <laughs> and hopefully not. And if that's the case, if I'm, if I'm already feeling it, maybe I'll just teach from home. But um, I'm going to do my best to be here to teach for you all that. Um, anyway, let's get going with this. I think all of that was to say that I'm going to do my best to learn your names. But I can't promise it's going to be right away. OK, so I've kind of talked about the different genres. Which one are you most interested in of environmental engineering? So I'll use this time to say my background. Uh, my undergraduate was Earth and Atmospheric Science. I uh, chose that going into college, partly because there was no specific environmental engineering program. And I didn't really feel like I wanted to be in civil engineering with a minor or like with a focus in environmental. It just didn't seem like something I was interested in. And I didn't really know the difference for engineering science anyway. Um, so that's actually where my undergraduate came came from, so it's a little bit more broad uh, in terms of environmental systems, um, a lot more chemistry involved, things like that. I still did take thermodynamics. It was, it was like my, my uh, I guess my degree had a lot of meteorologists. So there was a lot of math for the meteorologists. We had to take differential equations. There's thermodynamics, again, mostly for the meteorologists like I mentioned. So I actually got most of the engineering fundamentals and I took a couple engineering classes as an undergraduate and then I went into environmental engineering for my PhD. And so the through line for me was pretty much water quality um, and water treatment. Uh, that's kind of what sparked my interest particularly is I kind of went from that earth systems and I wanted to be a little more applied to humanity and I wanted to do therefore kind of disinfection technologies and ended up uh, heading that route. Certainly, I understand a lot of people here in Louisiana, especially it's a lot of coastal resources and a lot of coastal challenges and um, lots to take care of and um, be engaged with. So that not not at all surprised to see that's the majority of you. Um, a lot of people interested more globally, and then a few of you um, just trying to get on my good side, I guess. Right? Yeah. Um, okay, so. Yeah, it, it scores you based on how fast you answer, but that, I, don't, I don't take that into any consideration, so ignore that. So how long have you been interested in environmental topics, or engineering in general, if, if not? Kind of got a feel for my own answer here. Um, I guess uh, before college, I knew I was interested, kind of math, science, just were the more interesting things, but I also always enjoyed um, exploring the creek behind my house, going fishing with my dad, things like that. So I was always kind of uh, leaning towards environmental systems. Um, not that I was really thinking about studying them as a, as a kid. <laughs> okay, so several of you pretty much all your life, um, and then a, a fair bit of you kind of more recently. Which, obviously, I put in there uh, studying, and, you know, like I said, I could answer that either way with the, the way that question worded. Okay, how old are you? Uh, I'm 34. So I would be in that green group. Pretty much all of all of you are sophomores at this point, right? Or thereabouts? No? Okay. What's that? Junior? Okay. Or transfer, yeah. 
Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah, so then that, that's pretty much what I'd expect then. Cool. So I, I asked this class for my, or this question for my, the class that I had been teaching, the larger group that has civil students, has chemical engineers, basically anybody interested in water and wastewater treatment would take that class who was not an environmental major. So we separate it for ABED, accreditation stuff. Got to make Gonna make you guys do a little more chemistry than the, the civil students have to. Okay, so where are you from? And by that, just answer, you know, where you spent most of your childhood. I think I mentioned I grew up in Georgia, and then I did all my schooling at Georgia Tech, so that would be technically further than two states away, but barely. Um, then I spent two years in Michigan. Um, so that's quite a contrast from the South, and that I did for about half a year. I worked at the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality. I was doing uh, wastewater permitting. Um, it was an entry-level job after my graduate degree, so I didn't stay there very long. Decided to try to go back to academics, and so I got a, ended up with a postdoc um, at Michigan State University um, before moving here. Okay, so a lot of you from Louisiana. Um, the rest of you nearby or or a little further. Cool. All right, which topic are you least comfortable with? So unit conversions, word problems in general, mass balances, uh, chemistry, biological processes. Of course, we've hardly even touched the topic of mass balances yet, so maybe you don't, don't know yet. So some, a little bit of each, a lot of uh, fear of chemistry. Do you guys like the uh, the little gif on the, the recorded lecture, the, the egg, egg in his face guy? Does, did that analogy help? Is, that, is it stuck in your head now? Some of you nodding, that's good. Sometimes it just has to be ridiculous and then it's like, oh right, it's, I, I get that. Or you can at least, uh, think back and remember that. Okay, so this little picture here. What does that picture make you think of? Okay, so 17 of you felt like, okay, well, there's there's iron and there's oxygen. There must be iron oxide, right? That, that's some sort of form of iron oxide. So good for you for recognizing that's iron and oxygen. Um, a few of you, two of you, recognize that that's pretty much impossible. I, want, I wonder if, maybe if that was the chemical engineers. Um, this oxygen has like two double bonds here and then two extra un sets of unpaired electrons. That's, that's not really possible. And iron probably doesn't do that either. So definitely impossible. Um, um, let's see. Seven of you uh, recognize this as, uh, for what it is, is a ferrous wheel. <laughs> um, fer iron is, uh, you know, the oxidized forms Fe2+, plus, Fe3+, plus, that's ferrous and ferric. I have a t-shirt that my sister gave me. It's basically that. That's the way I remember the difference between ferrous and ferric. Ferris is the two plus one. That's the, the one on my shirt, and uh, it's a good pun. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's why you might recognize it from a state fair. So seven of you got that, and five of you just hate jokes and chemistry altogether. So yeah. Okay. Speaking of puns, do you enjoy a good pun?
interesting. I can only see you grimace from your eyes now instead of like your, your whole face grimace. I didn't even give you a, an option to, uh, to hate on it. Okay, so pun, puns are great. All right, I believe that's all I am going to do at the moment. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. Okay, so coming back to the idea of mass balances. So mass being what we're interested in in terms of physical or chemical or biological processes, transporting it, transforming it, doing whatever to the mass, right? We want to track the mass. That's kind of the, a fundamental thing about the class that we're going to have to do and we are going to want to do with precision and with the ability to um, you know, track it, make sure we're converting units correctly. What we're saying is really what we think we're saying, not something accidentally different for a unit conversion or something. And one of the easy um, analogies that can help us understand this concept of mass balance is simply a bank account. So I'm going to refer to this a few times, but um, you can think of your bank account as some container that has a mass of money. So I say mass balance, sometimes we will also use a number balance, which usually can correlate to mass, but you might say the number of pathogens. It's going to be a lot easier than weighing each pathogen and saying, okay, well, there's there's 0 0.0001 grams of bacteria here, and we think that's about 300 trillion bacteria, right, or whatever, you know. So usually we'll be talking about mass balance. Sometimes we'll interchange that with a numbers balance, maybe the number of dollars, mass, number. We're going to use those often analogously, but consistent within a problem. So if you look at how much money is coming into your account, compare that to how much is being expent, that's an input rate, you know, X number of dollars in a month, X numbers out a month, and then you could have some reaction happening inside, which is interest rates, right? It could be a growth rate, you're earning money, it could be, you know, in the case of a, a debt, it could be a negative interest rate, you're owing more money, um, so you would call that a, a kind of a negative thing. It could also be like a fee, maybe you're, you're charged a fee every so often, that would be you could consider either as an expense or perhaps as a rate, um, depending on how you wanted to define it. But that this analogy is going to help because we can see that a, you know, we can see each component of a system like what we're going to do with mass balances. So here's the, um, okay, I wanted to show a mass balance. I'm going to see if I can do this effectively. Um, one of my issues was I was trying to get an electronic copy of our textbook and our library just couldn't find it. So I'm going to try to get better scans or whatever in case you're interested. This is our textbook. Um, for the most part, I'm going to try to have the material at hand for you. Um, at some, sometimes I might not be able to do that. Today, I'm going to try to use my webcam to do this. So. Give me one moment. I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to do that actually. I'm going to be able to show only on the stream, which is not very helpful. We'll give it a try. See what I can. I don't think that's going to work very well. So we're not going to do that. Um, we have another example we'll take a look at. I might read through this one with you for a moment. Um, get 
of that step back. Okay, so if we did take a look, um, essentially, this problem is, I'll read the problem and then kind of draw the diagram and, and kind of talk you through it a little bit. It's just a very basic example of kind of a mass balance. How do you even describe it, talk about it? Um, and then we'll take a look at one from a different book that I've already got um, copied up there. So, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Consumer have no children. In an average week, they purchase and bring into their house approximately 50 kilograms of consumer goods. Food, magazines, newspapers, appliances, furniture, and associated packaging. Of this amount, 50% is consumed as food. Half of the food is used for biological maintenance and ultimately released as CO2. The remainder is discharged to the sewer system. The consumers recycle approximately 25% of solid waste that is generated. Approximately one kilogram accumulates in the house. Estimate the amount of solid waste placed at the curb each week. So mass balance of what these consumers are doing with their lives in terms of how much mass of stuff is coming in, whether it's eaten, discharged to the sewer. So we have an input of going shopping and bringing consumer goods into the house. And then we have an output of how much sewage is discharged and how much garbage is brought to the trash. And then a third one, if you notice, how much CO2 is released for the biological processing in the body. Okay, so all of that just, you know, little word problem there, lots of information, and it just like kind of hits you with all sorts of different stuff. So what we're going to do, and what the book does, is they draw a little house. And what they're looking at is the accumulation of mass in that house. And I guess we have the, the front door over here and a sewer line going out. And then we have what's coming in are these consumer goods. We have the solid waste leaving in the sewage. And we have, um, they drew another air, arrow um, coming out here, and they just called this food to people. So I think this is probably their description of whatever food is being used in, uh, in terms of converted to CO2. Okay, now this is the basics of their drawing, and you could look, it's, you know, they have a chimney, okay, so maybe, maybe we need a chimney too. So that's their drawing, and what the only other thing they have is what's called a control boundary, or a control volume boundary. So what they what they do is they say, okay, well, how we analyze the system is we put some limitation on it and only look at what comes in and out of that boundary, okay? And anything that happens inside that boundary, we'll consider maybe a rate if they had, you know. Um, some reaction inside, maybe the house is burning, releasing lots of CO2. Perhaps that, you know, you could, I guess, catch that as the gas transfers away. Or if somehow you managed a way to destroy matter or create matter, you'd have that term in there as well, right? Um, if you were looking at specifically, let's say, how many uh, grapes are in there, and you have a grape tree growing in, or grapevine growing inside, that would be a reaction growing grapes, right? Silly example here, but there, there are reactions that could take place inside the control volume. And so what they do is they just draw a box for their control volume. And so what this does is that lets you consider only the things that cross that boundary. So this crosses the boundary, this crosses the boundary, this crosses the boundary. So that gives you a way to simplify the process and know really kind of what you're talking about there. Okay, so the, the solution starts by saying, 
begin by drawing a mass balance diagram, labeling all the known and unknown inputs and outputs. Um, there are, in fact, two diagrams, one for the house and one for the people. However, one mass balance um, for the people is superfluous, doesn't really matter, um, for the solution of the problem because they're still inside the house. Right? So if it's happening inside that control volume, we don't need to draw the little people. Okay, so then, so to answer the question, they were, they were asking, you know, going back to the question, estimate the amount of solid waste they place at the curb each week. Okay, so so solid waste, and I just realized I made a mistake. Um, the solid waste here, this is what they're putting at the curb. So the the sewage then is a reaction, I suppose. They're considering it just probably goes away, and they're not tracking that. So this is at the curb. So I'm, I misread the problem there. Um, so that's that's our question. What mass are we looking for there? So almost every mass balance problem you're going to do is going to involve a, some steps that are similar to this, right? You first want to draw what's happening and identify where in this picture are you concerned about. Some problems you might eventually be concerned about multiple spots at different times. So you can draw a control volume including everything or including one section of it to see what's happening just at that spot. When we get into different types of reactors or environmental systems, you'll, you'll do very well to draw it out carefully and then kind of see where you go with it. Okay, so that's how they start. It says in the solution and what you'll see a lot of times in the problems is a prompt that says write a mass balance. Anybody feel like they know what it means to write a mass balance? Somewhat if you have, if you, you know, the people transferred from chemical engineering probably have a, a decent idea. But even still, like, isn't it a little bit vague? Like, what exactly does that mean? <laughs> you know, so it, it's a annoying concept because your instructors will always be like, oh, just write a mass balance. What? <laughs> so if you think about writing out uh, an equation for a line, y equals mx plus b, you're very familiar with that. And you know that, oh, well, if I have a graph and a, a line and know something about it, I can solve for x, I can solve for y, I can solve for b, I can solve for m, whatever. Like, I can, I can solve for something if I have some parameters. But a mass balance is the same concept of solving for some parameter. However, the equation, what it looks like, is going to depend on the system you're, you're drawing. So based on the drawing, based on what's going on in there, we're going to have a mass balance that's derived from the principle of conservation of mass. Okay, Stuff's moving around, and we have some information about that. We just have to draw, the, draw up a new y equals mx plus b. Right? So for y equals mx plus b, that's you know, pretty much always true for a line, right? Well, for a mass balance, that governing equation, we could say, or controlling equation, is going to depend on what what's going on within that control volume and what's passing through it. But it's still going to be the same thing in terms of you have some parameters, there's a set equation, there's some rationality to the equation, right? Y equals mx plus b. We know, based on the definition of a line, one thing changes as a function of something else changing plus some starting point, right? That, that's you know, fundamental. You've learned that years ago. Mass balance also has a governing equation, but that equation depends on your system. And then what you're solving for within that equation is going to just depend on what you're interested in. If you wanted to know, for example, on a, on a line, what does y equal at some point, then you know, okay, I'm solving for y, I just need to plug in mx plus b. If you wanted to know what b was, and you had some information otherwise, you rearrange and solve, right? 
it's the same thing. You just have to know what you're rearranging for. So when we talk about mass balances, so I'm just going to say a parameter or variable. So when we talk about derive a mass balance, I'm asking you to get y, like write out what the y equals mx plus b equation is, what the governing equation is. It's not going to be y equals mx plus b. But you write that out based on the system. That's the first challenge, is understanding what the system looks like, where to put the pieces. We're going to talk more about that. And then you have to identify, oh, what was I looking for? I was looking for the amount of mass being put at the curb every week or per day or whatever. Um, that's the one component. So it's going to be more complicated than y equals mx plus b, but it's going to get you, it's going to be the same process. You have some equation, you identify that parameter that you want to know about, figure out how to rearrange the equation so you can solve for it. You've done it before, and you've, the calculus that's involved, where it's involved, is simple. And it's just literally remembering one or two things, and then you've got it. So we're going to go through that for the different reactions. But this concept will be repeated throughout the semester, essentially. And we're going to address different types of problems, make sure that we can comfortably handle problems in different realms, air, water, um, soil perhaps, um, and context. Okay, so let me just uh, continue. I think what will be more useful is to come back to this when um, this problem in particular to uh, work through it later when I'm a little more prepared on that one. So for now, I'm going to just keep that as a, an intro to how you would approach a mass balance and give you some practice with a, a small one um, in just a moment. So for a mass balance, really what we're looking at, and that previous problem kind of showed you, was you're looking for some accumulation. How much money in a bank account is, you know, how much are you accumulating? Are you accumulating? So for a, a checking account, you kind of don't want to accumulate one way or the other. If you're accumulating lots and lots of money in a checking account, you probably should put it to a savings account where it's actually going to have more interest, right? Um, if you are depleting it, well, that's not good because you're going to run out of money, and you don't want to do that typically. So you have some input rates. Then you have some output rates. And then you might have some sort of reaction happening inside. And this could be positive or negative. It could be a, a growth or decay. So in terms of a mass balance, that's really all you need is in a system, and in this case, you could draw a control, control volume like this or something. In a system, how much stuff is coming in? Maybe you have, we'll see in a moment, a problem with you have more than one input. You could have more than one output, but whatever the case, what's coming in, what's going out, and what's happening inside, all of that comes together with what we call the accumulation rate. We're almost always going to be talking about mass per time. And if you remember from that example a moment ago, they were talking about mass of garbage per day or per week. So we're always going to be in mass, sometimes number, per time, as the net accumulation. So that's like, how much money are you accumulating per month? If your expenditures are less than your income, then you're accumulating some amount of money every month, right? So a lot of times in environmental systems, we will talk about steady state um, systems, meaning it's that checking account that we have the same amount coming in every month as we have going out every month. It's happy checking account. Nothing really fancy is happening. Um, it's at a net accumulation of zero. If you think about a retirement account, the idea is you save up enough money that the interest rate is paying your income. And then the net accumulation is zero. You're, you have some money in there. It's sitting there. 
there's a reaction producing money, but you're taking that much out. You're no longer putting any money in because you know you're retired, you're no longer getting an income, but you're taking that reaction growth out every month and hopefully it's about equal to, um, you know, that reaction rate will be about equal to what you're taking out. And so the net accumulation is zero, right? So we see this in, in our, you know, accounting and stuff uh, quite often. So steady state being when that accumulation is zero, okay? We, we can solve problems for non-steady state and for steady state. And the only difference is when we talk about writing that equation, that y equals mx plus b sort of thing, we're, what we're do doing is a mass balance, meaning there's no creation or, de or destruction of mass. It's all conserved. It's either accumulating, you know, or let's say the accumulation rate is going to be equal to what you're putting in, minus what you're taking out, plus anything that's growing, minus anything that's decaying. And the only thing is, each of these terms needs to be mass per time. So as we go through the different forms of these mass balances, what we're going to see is each of these ultimately are going to be in mass per time units. Okay, that means right up front here, for and for the rest of the class, you have a great way to check yourself. Did you construct your y equals mx plus b governing equation correctly? And if your terms are not like terms, you can't actually add them together, you can immediately say, oh wait, something's off here. I missed I'm I'm I missed something, right? If they're not going to if the terms are not going to um, cancel or combine properly, then there's an issue. Okay, so let's take a look at this problem. This is a different book I've used a lot for my other class. Probably would have been a great book for this class too, so I'm gonna use it sometimes. Um, don't worry about getting it, but I'll tell you more about it if you're interested. Um, so a stream is flowing at 10 cubic meters per second, has a tributary feeding into it with a flow of 5 cubic meters per second. The stream's concentration of chloride upstream, chloride is just Cl minus, of the junction is two, uh, 20 milligrams per liter. The tributary chloride concentration is 40 milligrams per liter. Treating the chloride as a conservative substance, that's a, not a political comment, that just means it's a, not reacting. So no reaction, and assuming complete mixing of the two streams, find the downstream chloride concentration. So we've got two streams, they mix, and the question is, what's happening downstream? Essentially, the, the question is encapsulated just in this picture. So take a minute, try to solve that for yourself, and then I'm gonna have, I'm gonna pull up the quiz again, and it'll ask you what's the answer. So give it a shot, see if you can get a good answer, get the right answer, and then we'll talk about it.
So this problem is can be done pretty well just on an intuitive basis. Um, so if you're finding it to be like, you're not sure what the whole mass balance thing is, but you kind of have an idea of how to solve the problem, that's good. But what I do want you to pay attention to is that like, there, you can apply that the very fundamentals of mass balance, conservation of mass, to create that mass balance equation, that governing equation, for you to then use and solve. So if you're thinking about it that way, maybe you take a minute and you, you get some sort of answer based on your intuition, you think this is right, word problem is not too complex, but then be thinking back on it as we go through it, see, okay, well, how is that actually like writing out a governing equation and solving, right? Be thinking about it in that, in that mindset. So you'll have another minute in the quiz itself. Let's see how you did. So what answer did you get or the closest one if you don't see your answer? Don't stress too much. I'm not grading this one today. This is just free credit. Normally it'll be, you'll get 75% of the quiz credit regardless, and then maybe 25% will score in terms of how well you did. So it gives a little more motivation to participate in the problems, but it's not a, a huge drain or anything. And a lot of times they'll be less quantitative and more kind of topical. And I'll save the quantitative for the homework exams. So most of you didn't get it right. Um, I think the uh, if we were to take a look at the uh, problem itself, um, the 40 and 80 options, I think, were if you used the wrong denominator. We'll talk about that. We'll show, I'll show you that in a minute. And I um, think the red answer was a, a wrong numerator, um, if you got those specifically. But. Couple more questions for you, just generally about mass balances and stuff. Um, might just even skip one of them, but we'll just finish off the uh, the quiz here. So, based on what I've said so far, what's the difference between steady state and dynamic systems?
Okay, so most of you've got it right. The steady state systems have no accumulation rate, no net accumulation. So you might have reactions happening. Um, there might be stuff being created inside, but that means there's more leaving than there was coming in. Or maybe you have stuff being created and stuff leaving, but nothing coming in. Um, and then those two would be equal. So um, it's not not the case that there are no reactions. Like I mentioned, that example of a, a retirement account, the idea is you have no net accumulation growth or removal of money in the account. It's just that interest is paying your income um, in retirement. That's that's the idea for some of the, some retirement systems. Um, so technically, if if you have reactor volumes that changed, that would complicate things a good bit. But that's not how we define steady state, and you could. Probably, if you had the right stuff leaving the reactor, you know, the right rates, then you could maybe have a steady state system when you are changing the volume. So that one's, that one's also not the correct answer. So it's really about whether or not you have net accumulation. And it's a good thing it doesn't depend on volume stuff because it's nice when volume, the, the reactor volumes stay the same. That's, that's a good thing. Okay. How many milliliters are in one cubic meter? So some of you got that right. Um, so 10 to the 6, that's 1 million. So 1 million milliliters per cubic meter. And so if you answered 10 to the 3rd, then perhaps you were remembering the conversion from liters to cubic meter, which I, I told you in that the recorded lecture to remember. So this is 1 liter, this bottle. And if you think about 1 cubic meter, well, a meter is a little more than 3 feet. So you have some container that's like that. You could, you could fit a thousand of these in that, right? But one milliliter is one one thousandth of a liter, right? So you have a thousand milliliters in here, multiply that by a thousand in that one cubic meter, um, and you get your, your one million milliliters per cubic meter. So if you're forgetting the conversions of, of these things, First of all, you're going to have some sort of density lookup table on an exam. Um, so you can use that because it's probably going to tell you that there's you know, some amount of kilograms of water per cubic meter. Okay? If you think about that, it turns out that the density of water you can define with one liter as well, even if it's given in some other term. One liter, if you think about that, how many pounds does that weigh if, I, if this was a full water bottle? Probably a little more than one pound, but definitely not more than five pounds. Right? So that puts it at one kilogram. That's actually at five degrees Celsius, that's pretty much the definition is one kilogram of water is one liter of water. So that's actually pretty handy. If you just visualize, think about the weight of one liter of water, it's about two pounds, two point something. You know, if I'm remembering that conversion right, maybe it's slightly less than two. Um, but it's it's something that you can heft, you could toss across the room if you wanted to. It's not something that's impossible to pick up, right? So just simply by that, and it's also not like one gram, right? So thinking about it that way, you can double check yourself like, oh yeah, there's a kilogram per liter. That means I can convert some other things. I can use that, oh, there's 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, oh, that, that means there's 1,000 liters per cubic meter. So there's there's a few things you can do if you don't simply commit it to memory that there's 1,000 liters in one cubic meter, which is a good thing to know. Uh, I'm stressing this because I mentioned it last in our, in our uh, recorded lecture, and I, I want you to know that on hand, um, 
And it may, you may come across some other things that I, I find important that you have on hand. Okay, so if I were to ask you to derive a mass balance equation for a steady state CSCR with first order decay, what's your first thought? And be honest. too bad. So nine of you said, okay, just have no idea. Um, today, I'm, I'm hoping you, you just have a tiny bit more of an idea by the end of today, um, but I'm not expecting you to know how to do this, right? Um, so 15 of you then are like, okay, well, I have some concept of the mass balance maybe, but like, what's a CSTR? Uh, one of you perhaps remembers that, but forgot kind of what to do with the, the rate component, and then five of you are just trying to get on my good side or something. <laughs> Kidding. Um, so, and five of you might recognize that, okay, well, this is an equation I've seen before, if I've solved something like that, where we have an input rate, a flow rate, and a concentration, and an output rate, it's flow rate concentration, and then that negative reaction term. So we'll get into that so that hopefully by the end of the semester, everybody's perfectly comfortable with that and can do that um, whenever I happen to ask. Okay, so let's come back to this question then. Um, this, uh, this problem, and we'll take a look at this in terms of a very simple mass balance, writing that governing equation. Um, we know that there was no reaction, and we know that it was like perfectly mixed in there, so really the inputs have to equal the outputs. So the, it has to be at steady state. There's no way that chloride could be um, increasing or decreasing in concentration like within that volume, right? There's, there's no, we were given no information that could lead us to think that. Maybe if the volume was evaporating enough in that little spot, but no, that's, it's a stream flowing through. We're not, we're not dealing with any crazy quarks like that. So the accumulation term is going to be zero, and we know that's going to be equal to the inputs minus the outputs. And now then the challenge is going to be to write all of the inputs in mass per time and all of the outputs in mass per time. Okay, So again, just being very uh, elaborate about this process to show you this, what we're doing in terms of writing that governing equation, I'm going to say, well, since it's 0 equals in minus output rates, we're going to do the inputs are equal to the outputs. A, a handy way of doing things when the accumulation term is zero. So we're going to have all the inputs. Really, if I'm being technical, I'll say input rates equal the output rates, because basically everything we do is a function of time. It's more practical that way because you know we're evaluating our bank account over months or years or whatever. We're accounting for how much water can we produce in a day things like that. Always referencing with time. So inputs, we have CS and QS for the stream coming in. Those are these two terms. And I'm just going to leave them as those labels for now, right? The y equals mx plus b. We're trying to map what is that equation for this case. We have another input rate. That's the this waste stream. So CW, QW, and the reason I'm doing C and Q time multiplied by each other, I should explain this is mass per volume times volume per time. That's the a concentration is a mass per volume. A flow rate is a flow as a volume per time passing through. So that gives us volumes cancel and that gives us the mass per time that we're looking for. And so for both of these cases and pretty much any input-output rate for it with a flow rate, that's the way we can do it. Maybe we'll encounter a problem someday where we're just injecting, like adding powder continuously. Then we have no flow, but we're adding mass. 
we could do that. It would just, it would no longer be a cube times a C, it would just be like a mass divided by time, right? But it, we could still put it in that term. So we'll, we'll talk more about that at another time. And that's going to be equal to what's going out. So the Q mixed times the C mixed. And here we just have kind of the, the same deal. And what we want to solve for, so there's our governing equation. There's our Y equals MX plus B, right? That's the analogy here. So that's our governing equation. And what you'll note is you could also write the equation for a line as 0 equals MX plus B minus Y. Right? So you could do um, Y equals MX plus B and 0 equals MX plus B minus Y. These are the same things, right? It's clear when you were talking about MX plus B's type stuff. But in this case, that would that's the equivalent of writing it as 0 equals inputs minus outputs or switching it to say inputs equals outputs with the when we know the accumulation is 0. So it's just rearranging stuff, right? That That's no problem. So um, with this, what do we want to answer for? Well, the question asked us, what is CM? What's the concentration in that mixed stream. Um, we also were not given the QM, so we're going to need that too. Given that there was no information about water disappearing or appearing from nowhere, conservation of mass, um, we know that the Q mixed is very simply going to be the Q from the stream plus Q from the waste. So that was um, one thing that if you didn't notice that, that would have been important, right? Um, so that's just going to be 10 plus 5 is 15 cubic meters per second. And then we have everything we need. So we have, we'll just go ahead and solve for CM. And that's going to be CS uh, QS plus CW QW divided by uh, the Q mixed. Right? So that's just rearranging this equation, solving for CM. Okay, so following this process seems very mundane. A lot of you got this perhaps on intuition. Perhaps you did some something like this. But inevitably, it took the same form whether you meant to or not. Um, so take a look through whatever process you used, and you'll note that if you got the right answer, this was sort of the way you went about it. Uh, now, that's going to be... so. The CS, QS, that's 20 um, milligrams per liter times 10 um, cubic meters per second, plus this was 40 milligrams per liter times 5 cubic meters per second. All that divided by our 15 cubic meters per second. And you'll notice there's cubic meters per second on the top and the bottom. Those are going to cancel, and we're going to be left with milligrams per liter. It's always worthwhile checking to make sure that you are going to get the units you are trying to solve for. That's really going to save you a lot of time and errors if you do go through and check, double check, that your units are lining up as they should. So with that, essentially that's 20 times 10, that's 200. 40 times 5, that's 200. So we've got 400 total on the top, divided by 15. CM, if I'm remembering correctly, is 26.7 milligrams per liter. Okay, so that was something simple enough that you probably could just intuitively solve as a word problem, but you can also see how this mass balance, conservation of mass, all that is applied. Okay? So we'll pick up there next time, and I'll see you guys on Thursday.